Well, good morning. good morning. My name is Peter Hay. I'm the pastor here at the Wilmington United Methodist Church, and I bid you welcome as we've gathered to worship our God, to celebrate our faith, and to renew our commitment to live our lives as disciples of Jesus Christ. It's also a special joy to welcome some honored guests we have all the way from the great state of Oklahoma. Diane and Max, we bid you welcome. These are Jameson's parents, and they've come to cheer him on as you run the marathon tomorrow. So and you got a haircut for the occasion, too, so. <laughs> and I also want to say a word of welcome to those of you who are joining us via the live stream. It's uh, so good that you can uh, worship with us in, in this way. Um, you will notice two cards in the pew racks. The green one is a connect card. If this is your first Sunday with us and you'd like to uh, leave us your contact information so we can be better acquainted, uh, you can use this green card. If you've always been a member here but you've had a change of address or anything, this is a convenient way that you can let us know that as well. And then also we have a, a yellow card called Share, Prayer, and Care. And if you have a prayer concern, you can fill this out and put it in the offering plate. And as the ushers bring the plates forward, they'll give them to me. And uh, we can share our prayer concerns in that way if you're not comfortable speaking them aloud. If you'd rather speak them aloud, uh, you'll be able to do that as well. I'll do my best to repeat it so everybody in the room and everybody on the live stream can be together and share the, and share the concerns. So I invite us now to... Uh, quiet time of meditation and reflection as Ben offers the morning prelude and we prepare ourselves to worship God. Good morning. Please stand and join me in the call to worship. On the long road of our faith journey, we wonder what lies ahead along the path. Through all our in-between stages of transformation, we wonder where am I going? Where am I growing? As we search for direction in life, we wonder how can I trust when everything is so uncertain. Moving in new paradigms and perspectives, we wonder. What will be revealed when I open up to new possibilities? Then the love of the divine reminds us. You too are my child. You can emerge to renewed life again and again. Amen. Our opening hymn is number 148. Many and great, O oh God.
seated. Holy One, we come to you in prayer, asking for you to cast your light upon all that cries out for change in our lives and in our communities. Long ago, on the road to Emmaus, Jesus opened the eyes of his traveling companions and gave them the gift of new sight. Shine your compassion into the cracks of our broken world and help us be a beacon of peace and connection for others. Well, this brings us to our time in our service for our young and for the young at heart. I think Miss Hope might be our only friend joining me up front, but we can have a little chat. How are you doing? <laughs> Hope that was a wonderful job playing the drums you did. <laughs> I wonder if you've ever heard the phrase some, of something being, oh, here comes some, how are you doing? <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> slides into home base. Have you all ever heard of something being too, so good that you have to see it to believe it? Something that if you didn't see it with your own eyes, you wouldn't believe that it existed. Can you think of something so exciting? What do you think? Anything jump to mind? I... Oh, the eclipse? <laughs> Did you get to see the eclipse? Hopefully not with your naked eyes, right? But I saw the eclipse, and it was pretty amazing. I agree. You have to see it to believe it. It was very cool. In fact, I think the eclipse was probably cooler. I looked up a list of things online, things that you have to see to believe. I don't think any of them were as cool as the eclipse. It had things like, one of them was a video of a big fluffy dog riding a scooter. <laughs> it's pretty cool, but not quite as good as an eclipse. There was also a video of a teeny tiny baby grasshopper, and someone put their, their hand down next to it, and it reached out and touched their hand, and they said it was the world's smallest fist bump. And it was so great, you just have to see it to believe it. I don't know that any of those stack up to the eclipse, but you know what might? Remember, just a couple weeks ago, we heard the story of Jesus' resurrection on Easter. And today we're reading a story about when the disciples see Jesus after the, after the Easter resurrection. And you know what they think that is? They think it's so great that even when they see it with their eyes, they're a little slow to believe it. They think this can't possibly be real because it's so amazingly wonderful that Jesus was resurrected and is back with them. And that's even better than the eclipse, I think. And guess what? We don't probably get to see Jesus walking around with us. And so we don't get to see Jesus with our own eyes to help us believe. But sometimes we can help people see Jesus through us to help them believe. When we do things that Jesus would want us to do, they might see, oh, those people that go to church all the time, they're so joyful and they're so nice and they're so generous and they're so lovely to be around. They always come say nice things to me. And in that, they might see us, and they can see a little bitty glimpse of Jesus. Kind of like we only get a little glimpse of the eclipse, and even that is pretty amazing. And so maybe in that, they get to see Jesus, and this thing that's so great that you might have to see it with your own eyes to believe it, they get to see it, and maybe they start to believe it. Will you pray with me? Dear God, we thank you for this time to gather here, and we pray that we would live lives where people get a little glimpse of you, that they might see you in us and come to believe. When we live lives where we're, we're kind to others, where we help people in need, where we uh, are generous with the things that you've blessed us with. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Oh. <laughs> Standing on my robe. I'll lead us downstairs for uh, Sunday school and nursery, and we might be back up, we might not. <laughs> Well, before we pass the peace, I would like to just uh, share with you that uh, uh, the Stones are watching us via a live stream down in South Carolina, and uh, they ask us to pray. Chris wants us to pray for her sister-in-law, Lori, as she's in the ICU with some heart issues, so we want to uh, be mindful 
of, of, of them at the appropriate time. And I did get a text from uh, uh, Susan Hindall. She's watching from home, and uh, she got good news. She had surgery this week, and they, uh, they did an uh, exploration of a, a mass that they took out, and they biopsied it, and she has no cancer. So uh, we rejoice. And uh, this, Paul, the stone said, can you turn the volume up? <laughs> I've never made that request from the pulpit before. <laughs> The peace of the Lord be with you always.
story of faith is not one of arrival, but of journey. The new butterfly struggle to push out of its confines produces a fissure that cannot be undone. There is no going back. The journey to a new existence has commenced. The post-resurrection story of Jesus opening the hearts of his fellow travelers along the road to Emmaus invites us to be companions of the one who will open us into the light of a new day. This morning's scripture reading is from Luke 24, 28 through 49. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Yet for all their joy, they were still disbelieving and wondering. And he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, And see, I am sending you upon what my father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Let us hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. The story of the disciples on the road to Emmaus requires us to deal at some level with the grief. See, the the disciples had left the city of Jerusalem. They had witnessed Jesus' arrest, the trial, the execution. And these two left at that moment. We're not quite sure where Emmaus really is. But Emmaus isn't so much a geographical place as it is a a state of mind. One of my favorite writers, Frederick Buechner, wrote these words. Emmaus is whatever we do or wherever we go to make ourselves forget to forget that the world holds nothing sacred. Where we spend much of our lives, you and I, the place where we go in order to escape. Maybe it's a bar, maybe it's a movie. Wherever it is we go to throw up our hands and say, let the whole damn thing go to hang. It makes no difference anyway. But there are some things that even in Emmaus, we cannot escape. 
We can escape our troubles, at least for a while. We can escape the job we didn't get or the friend we hurt. We can even escape for a while the awful suspicion that life makes no sense and that the religion of Jesus is just a lot of wishful thinking. But the one thing we cannot escape is life itself. The disciples were trying to escape, to get away from something that was painful, hard to bear. But they left too soon. They left before the good news had been proclaimed, that Jesus had risen from the grave. And so Jesus comes to them. Well, they're, they're doing what we all would do in the face of great loss and difficulty. They're grieving. That is, they're expressing over and over again their shock and their disappointment, the hurt and all the difficult experiences that they had gone through. But the one who listens to them is not a stranger. It is the risen Lord himself. Caring, attentive. And then, when he did something that was very familiar, he took bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and all of a sudden, they realized. He opened their minds. He opened their eyes. It was Jesus. When light comes into the chrysalis, the butterfly gets its first taste of air on its wet wings and crumpled wings. And how can it help but to begin a process of opening up toward the light and to come forth? The story is the story of Emmaus, the story of the resurrection is at the end of Luke's gospel, where Jesus is alive. And then how do you keep an encounter like that to yourself? Just like the butterfly cannot deny the impetus to get out of the chrysalis, the disciples now have a burning truth in their heart that they must give voice to. Their hearts are burning, their minds and their eyes are open. Death itself has been undone. There is now a powerful, Life-giving hope. Life-giving hope. I read something interesting this week. Meryl Streep once applied, once auditioned for a part in the movie King Kong. And she didn't get it. The producer said she was ugly. I guess you have to be gorgeous to be mauled and attacked by a giant gorilla these days. <laughs> now, Meryl Streep could have just sort of given up in that moment, accepted the untrue words of this one producer. But she didn't do that. She went on, has had a wonderful career of uh, acting and, and contributing so much. She didn't let one painful experience hold her back. I understand that, that somewhere in the state of North Carolina, there is a JV basketball coach who has on his resume uh, that he cut Michael Jordan from the team. <laughs> That'd be a tough one to live down, wouldn't it? 
Thankfully, Michael Jordan did not take that as the last word. He continued. I like the writings of a woman by the name of Caroline Fox. She was one of the early Quakers, and she wrote this about a reflection she had as she sat in church one day. The first gleam of light, the first cold light of morning, which gave the promise of day with its noontide glories, dawned on me one day at meeting when I had been meditating on my state in Great Depression. I seemed to hear the words articulated in my spirit. Live up to the light that thou hast, and more will be granted thee. Then I believed that God speaks to us by God's Spirit, and I strove to lead a more Christian life in unison with what I knew to be right and looked for brighter days, not forgetting the blessings that are granted in prayer. You know, I, I kind of woke up this morning thinking uh, today is the very last day of the NBA season. And I, I had some admiration for uh, Brad Stevens. He was a great college coach. And then he became the coach in Boston and, and coached and coached. Now, I know I got a couple Oklahoma City Thunder fans in the room, so <laughs> I, I trust you'll forgive me. But he worked hard. He did a good job. And maybe, just maybe, this will be the year the Boston Celtics will take the title. But it's perseverance. He had to go through some tough things, ups and downs and, and difficulties. My friends, as an Easter people, we know that Christ is risen and, and that the risen one journeys with us. We don't ever need to give up. Leonard Cohen sings a song. This is the refrain. Ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There's a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. I came across a heartwarming story I'd like to share with you. It was uh, a story about a shoebox baby. It begins in a hard place, but it ends with resurrection hope. See this teenage boy brought this baby into a hospital. It was in a shoebox. It was wrapped in a dish towel. He was terrified. He was simply going to just leave the baby there and go. In fact, left a note in the box along with the baby saying what the baby's name is. And then a note to the baby. It's not that we didn't love you. It's that we, we can't care for you. Well, he was going to quietly sneak out of the hospital once he delivered the baby in a shoebox. But, well, he just couldn't. He paid attention, listened. And there was this wonderful nurse by the name of Jean who said, you know, if you walk out now, you'll have no rights for this child at all. So he stayed. And while the medical staff did everything they could, she listened to the story. Apparently, his, he and his girlfriend had conceived a child 
and they were both about 15 years old. And it was particularly hard on this young woman because her mother had conceived her when she was 15 and had been raised by her grandparents. And she just couldn't bear the thought of, of uh, telling her parents and her grandparents that the cycle was happening again. So they told no one of the pregnancy and she was able to hide it. And then one night when she was all by herself, she gave birth to the child prematurely. Then she and her boyfriend hatched this plan to, to just take the baby to the hospital and trust that it would be cared for. But Jean met them both, cared about them, and said to them over and over again, your parents love you unconditionally. No matter what, they'll accept you. They'll care about you. You don't have to be embarrassed. You don't have to be ashamed. And in fact, one moment when it was the, the hardest moment of all, when they saw their little child in such distress, they blamed it all on themselves. This is all my fault. But this wonderful, kind, caring nurse put her arms around both of them and said, no, you didn't cause this. In fact, you saved this baby's life. Because you brought him here, he could be treated for dehydration and he could be cared for with all of the, the, the technology that's available to us. You really are a hero in this story. You have nothing to be ashamed of. The light got in. Cracked open to love and grace. Well, the baby did just fine. And mom went back and finished high school. She went on, she went to college. She went to nursing school. She didn't give up. She found hope and kindness. My friends, as a Christian people, we are called to be those kinds of people of hope. Never to speak the words of judgment and rejection, but always to speak a word of promise. For Jesus Christ rose from the grave. The power of love and life is here. The power of love in life is for all people. We don't give up. We believe in the risen Christ. Amen. I do want to continue to express my gratitude to you for your ongoing financial support. Uh, some go to the church's website and follow the prompts for online giving. Others have gone to their own bank and arranged to have their gifts sent in that way. And if you came today with a gift to share, our ushers will uh, wait upon you for those offerings.
Accept, Almighty God, these gifts which we, your people, offer, each an expression of our love and of our longing, our love for you and our longing to be a part of your good work in the world. Bless all that we give and guide who we become. Amen. Would you please be seated? Well, I shared earlier a, a prayer concern from uh, uh, David and Chris Stone about um, uh, Chris's sister. So we're holding, holding her in our prayers. And uh, we also want to keep Bill Clint wants to say thank you for the prayers and the support that he experienced. He's home recovering, and uh, he's very grateful for, for all of Jen's help. And uh, by way of the cards that have come in, Denise Farnsworth asks us to pray for uh, my son-in-law's aunt and cousin in Hawaii who are, who, are in a, who are both battling with cancer. So we'll keep your family circle in our prayers, Denise. And... Uh, Prayers for Beverly Cashman as she's going to have surgery tomorrow. And uh, prayers from Sheila. My son Chris, who is running in the Boston Marathon tomorrow. So we'll pray for Chris and we'll pray for you, Jameson, as you uh, undertake that wonderful endeavor. And uh, the family and friends of Brian Steer. Are there other concerns that we would like to share? Yes, Al. Thank you, Leonard. He's a great teacher for me. And the sermon for this one. Glennis? Yeah, I can say it's very well. Your middle granddaughter's preaching her very first sermon. Yeah. Woohoo! Congratulations. <laughs> Good first day to play this week. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Jane. So pray for baby Lydia, one month old and having some surgery, and uh, thank you. Are there others? Yes, Kim? Pray for my stepfather and his family. Um, they lose grandmother when they die. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, so prayers for Kim's family as, as uh, she had a death in her family. Yes, Marshall? Prayers for Andrew and the loss of his mother, Joan. Yes? Wonderful. Wonderful uh, celebration of your 60th wedding anniversary. Uh, after the benediction and before the postlude, I'm going to ask you both to come forward and uh, offer a prayer of blessing and uh, celebrate that milestone in your family's life. Yes, please. Oh, wonderful. Congratulations. The birth of a, your first grandchild. Yes. Prayers for air and giving thanks for the glad day of his birth and the second. Yes, indeed. I was uh, shocked last night as I watched the news and uh, that Iran has launched all those missiles into, into Israel. And uh, certainly pray for peace. And um, yes, thank you. Yes, Ed? Prayers for the Sarantino family as the as Roy passed. Yes. Oh wow! Congratulations. That's great. Did I hear? Yep. Yes. Prayers for Nick Rydell, who's beginning radio 
radiation and chemotherapy this week. Continue prayers for Nick Rideout as he's going through chemo and radiation treatments. If there are no, yes. Yes, okay, thank you. Yes. Indeed he is. Well, Jameson, would you lead us in prayer? Would you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, we thank you for this time to gather here, to gather in the, the joys of, of community, of music, of the sunlight streaming through our windows. We thank you for this time to gather with your people in this community of faith. We know that you are here with us, that you are here when we gather in your name. We lift up those names that are spoken here today for all of those facing loss of loved ones, facing the anxiety of difficult diagnoses, of, of uh, long roads to recovery. We pray that your hand of healing would be on them, that your hand of compassion and comfort would be on those in times of loss, that your love would be felt, that the peace that only you can offer would be known, and that we as this community would do our part to extend it to one another. We lift up those in times of celebration, those rejoicing uh, transitions in life, new beginnings, new jobs, new opportunities. We pray that uh, your love would be felt and the blessings that you offer each and every one of us in the small and in the large uh, things that we receive from you each and every day. We lift up those around the world, in times of violence, times of anxiety, helpless in the face of warring powers. We pray that Peace would reign that even in those darkest of times, those darkest of places, that your, your light would shine, that your hope would be felt and known even in the most hopeless of situations. For all of these and those things that are unspoken, those on our hearts and minds, though they're not spoken here, we know that they are known to you. We know that you care for us, that you love us. And all this we pray as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and power. Are there words of announcement that we'd like to share with one another? Yes. One of Great, Martha. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I attended this week at Sneaking Up on Us, the meeting for Fun on the Fourth, and there are some plans coming together with that. As always, we will be asking for volunteers and for soda and water donations. One of the big changes with that is they're adding a fifth night beginning on Wednesday this week, so even more so, we'll need volunteers. Keep an eye out for more details coming to be posted. Sign-ups, I'm sure, will be online in the back of the sanctuary in the coming weeks and we've got uh just a month and a half six weeks or so now it's sneaking up <laughs> i'd also call your attention to uh S sunday may 19th we're doing a program called rise against hunger and uh we hope to have about 80 volunteers to uh, uh pack food that will be sent to places in the world where there is starvation so these are uh, uh a very good meals that can be uh a lifesaver for some people. So uh, everything you need to know about how to participate in that is in our e-weekly. And so please read through that. And uh, if you can all participate, in it, if you can participate in any way, 
uh, please do so. If there are no other announcements, I invite us to sing our final hymn, number 2059, I Am Your Mother. And then I'll also, at the end of the hymn, I'd ask uh, Max to come and give us the benediction. Max is a pastor in Oklahoma, and he's here to uh, cheer Jameson on for the marathon. And, and I would just like to say publicly, uh, what a wonderful son you have. We are so blessed. We are so blessed. that he is one of a deep and profound Christian character. He offers great leadership to our young people, and uh, we are just delighted. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Let me sing. Enjoy it when we have opportunity to worship with you here at Wilmington United Methodist Church and receive this benediction. Now go into your lives, trusting the light of hope, even when the destination ahead is still unknown. And may the assurance of the God who created you, the God who is raising you, and the spirit that will unleash you be with you now and always. Will you say it with me, the last two words? Blessed be. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I invite you to come forward, please. Please be seated. Turn and face your loving family here. What a joy it is to mark your 60th wedding anniversary. And uh, so grateful for you two and the way you have uh, lived your life among us as fine, upstanding, wonderful people leading us and guiding us in so many ways. And uh, your love for one another, as we say in the wedding ritual, is a beacon and a light to all. And, and all to whom love is a stranger have found in you generous friends. So join your hands, please. Oh God, we give you thanks on this wonderful occasion for the witness of love, for the strength of a bond, and for the deep, 
deep carry. We rejoice and we offer blessing on this day. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now I understand we're gonna play your song. Let's sing it again. Uh, uh, 